Well, I think the, uh, frankly, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I think the biggest problem we face, and these accidents all show it, is human error and the training of the officers of the various ships involved. Each one of those casualties involved a, a, an error by a navigation, an error by the person standing watch, or the bridge team, as we say, and particularly by the captain of the ship. Now, I'm speaking, in a, this is very controversial, because particularly in the case of El Faro, no, con, no conclusions have been drawn, and there may have been a number of factors causing the loss of that ship. El Faro was the ship that was sunk off the United States, uh, the, uh, and it was 33 lives were lost uh, shortly before the end of last year. The uh, question is, how do we lose all those lives? Seawall is another example off the coast of Korea with all those students who were killed. Uh, tremendous loss of life. We still find that judgments and training are the most important thing. Sometimes very well-trained officers make remarkable mistakes, and it's very easy, I realize, to criticize in hindsight. But the fact is that a large number of the accidents that we see and, and therefore, the increasing issue of regulatory burden. As a result, each accident generates new regulations, new conventions, new requirements. The, the, the most important thing is training. And what we are finding in my business, which is the Marshall Islands Ship Registry, is that fatigue is the greatest issue. Uh, people are standing watch for very long hours, there are fewer people standing watch, so that the master of the ship is one of the watchstanders. The chief mate, the first officer, is standing watch for long hours. They become, their reflexes and their attention become seriously and adversely affected by long hours of watch. And frankly, the Maritime Labor Convention has not cured or even helped this problem. The problem is getting worse, not better, of fatigue at sea. Some people who serve on ships, so-called ratings, can in fact uh, um, go without sleep, without disastrous results. But most of the accidents we see are the result of exhaustion, lack of sleep, and there are other problems involved. We are watching the number of people who are committing suicide, crew members, and that is a significant factor. Loss of life, which very often appears to be accidental, sometimes is a deliberate suicide. And this is a subject that is not discussed very often, but we are gathering more and more, the industry is gathering more and more statistics about suicides. The fatigue factor seems to build in to the suicide factor. And it's a very shocking thing, but it's true. We, we should expect all of those things to happen, but there's one other thing that's very significant. We, we've dis there's been quite a lot of discussion here at Posidonia this year, and that is what, for want of a better expression, we call big data. We need information. The industry needs information, and it, and it is rapidly getting it because now, with, the, with, with modern uh, electronics, it is possible to monitor what happens on shore and at sea, and to go back and learn a great deal of many lessons that we really couldn't learn in the past because we didn't have a way of monitoring them. So regulation is going to, I'm sorry to say, to grow. This is also something that builds into what I mentioned before, which is fatigue. But in addition to regulation, uh, it is, uh, okay, why are accidents happening? Why are environmental problems existing? The thing to remember, first of all, is there are far fewer accidents than there used to be. The safety, safety at sea has greatly improved. Okay. When I started in this business 40 years ago, uh, exactly, and it was also my first visit to Posidonia 40 years ago this year, uh, we had a massive problem with tank cleaning explosions, uh, mostly the tanker casualties. Of course, there were a lot of oil spills, there were collisions, but there were also casualties involving the inability of the crew to use inert gas and other things that would prevent a vessel loss or an oil spill. And it was very largely oil spills that were our concern. 
Uh, port state control, which we're talking about a lot this year, as we do every year, was a product of the Marpal Convention, which came in after the loss of the, of the Amoco Cadiz in 1979. Uh, these probably, the, the, there has been an enormous improvement of sa in safety and marine environmental protection. We talk now about emissions, we talk about ballast water. Uh, these were not issues that were really on the radar screen uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And what it, but, but we still find that the human element predominates as a, as a major safety issue. And we need to pay more attention to the condition of the crew, the training of the crew, and particularly now what we are beginning to encounter, which is the shortage of seafarers. Uh, even even get granted the de depressed conditions in the industry, uh, we are not training an adequate number of new people to come in to the sea, to the to the profession. Many people are getting older and leaving, going into other things, going ashore, and they're not being replaced in adequately trained numbers. That is a big big factor, I find. I think the biggest challenge is that we need to enforce it. In other words, the, the flag states like my, like the Marshall Islands, which is now, we're now the biggest flag state in terms of Greek owners. We also the third largest in the world. We are, and, and I mentioned big data a minute ago, we are in fact getting more and more information, which we never got before, on, for example, the maritime, the MLC, the Maritime Labor Convention. How is it working? what is missing, what do we do to strengthen it? Uh, several challenges. First challenge is continuous improvement. Where we see shortcomings, we have to be able to apply ourselves to eliminate problems. That's the first thing. Second challenge is we are placing a great deal of burden on the crew, as you know, to comply with port state and flag state control requirements. This is a, a big, big burden on a limited number of people who serve at sea. It's a big burden on people ashore. And the, 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 uh, the amount of time that they have and their, uh, the adequacy of their hours of sleep that I referred to before are impinged upon by an increasingly regular, uh, increasing burden of what, for want of a better expression, I call paperwork. Uh, the, the, we have to find a way to lighten the actual daily workload of officers and ratings, crew members, of all kinds of ships. Now, if you go aboard a cruise ship, for example, they have a very, very big bridge team. These passenger ships that are coming into Piraeus have two bridges, many of them, and there are 10 or 20 people who are part of the bridge team. But that's not true of a tanker, it's not true of a container ship. We have to deal with that, and we have to find a way to make life bearable for, for, for people. Otherwise, they're not gonna be willing to work in our profession. The other thing is that, again, the Maritime Labor Convention is not a cure-all. It does not solve all of the problems that people want solved. We, you, mentioned, you have mentioned a number of sinkings and a number of casualties. Some of them were major ones in the last year, two years, three years. Those, as I say, are human element casualties. The third element, let's talk about ballast water management. Let's talk about emissions. Uh, this is going to place very big demands on an industry which is financially stressed and doesn't necessarily have the money to comply with these new requirements. Once we hear, and we're going to hear today from the U.S. Coast Guard, what the U.S. is doing in the area of ballast water treatment, and it's a complex subject. It's an expensive subject. How do we pay for all of these things? One other thing, and again, you won't hear this from too many other people, but it has been discussed here at Posidonia in the margins of the conference. And that is that all of these regulatory burdens, like, coast, like port state control, flag state control, cost money. Uh, there is no global or worldwide way of paying for these things. Now, the Marshall Islands, because we're a big registry, has the money to pay for our regulatory burden as a flag state. But if you're talking about a ship going in to a port in, in Africa or a port in Asia where the country is a poor country, they don't have the money to, to mount 
the kind of adequate port state control that they need to do under law, under our international conventions. The IMO is working on, and I hope we will see developed, a global funding mechanism so that all the ships and all the countries involved will be able to share the financial burden of if you go into Angola, for example, or Mozambique, or Egypt, that we will have adequate and not corrupt port state control. One of the biggest issues in developing countries is that port state control authorities can be corrupt and they'll take bribes. And this undermines the whole system. Corruption always does. Uh, same, same with not only port state control, but flag state control. Uh, and, and some of the problems, for example, I'm, the, the uh, Sewol, which was the Korean casualty, there's very strong evidence that in that particular case, there was corruption involved and that it was systemic in the Korean registry for a number of years before the Sewol tragedy. I hope I've answered your question. It's a very broad question, but, but, but those are the, that is where I think we need to target very pointedly who's going to pay, how much are they going to pay, and how are we going to have a global system that is effective everywhere and not just here. You know, the EU has done a very good job. Greece has done a very good job. Greece's seas, if you go swimming, as I did the other day, the Mediterranean is beautiful and clear here now. You know, 20 years ago, that was not the case. You could go swimming here off Athens and you would see all the garbage floating in the water. You don't need more. But if you go to North Africa, across from here, you will still see that. See that? And, and a country like Libya, which is a failed state, who's going to clean up their waters?